Welcome to another edition of War Masters Workshop Masterclass. Um, today we're going to be putting together a Mandalorian helmet from scratch using the uh, Wizard of Flight templates. <clears throat> These templates are available on uh, the Mandalorian Mercs website, www.mandaloriamercs.org. You can also get them on the Dennett Helmet website, uh, the dennetthelmet.com. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start out by cutting these templates out and then um, creating a scaffolding and then using these paper templates that we cut out to wrap around the scaffolding and then we'll fiberglass it. We'll use epoxy resin um, in that process of fiberglassing and then we'll go over it with body filler to smooth it down real well and uh, make it nice and smooth and ready for painting. So what we're looking at here, these are just the templates that you will print off to make your helmet. Um, there's about 20 or so pages of these templates, and uh, it also includes the scaffolding that you have to use to, uh, to create the helmet to, to wrap the templates around. Uh, the ear pieces are on this template as well as the uh, uh, RF, the rangefinder stock. But uh, these templates are easily downloadable and, and just print them out on a normal printer. I used cardstock, I believe 60 pound cardstock paper so that they would be nice and rigid. Um, since I was going to be fiberglassing to the top of the templates, I wanted them to be good and rigid. Now here is our scaffolding that we've made using those templates. I've used um, uh, foam core project board to make this scaffolding so it would be very strong for the purposes that um, that we're going to be using it for today um, for the fiberglassing and the resin uh, portion. Uh, I wanted it to be good and strong so that it would hold up to me brushing on the resin and wrapping the templates around and, and all of that. So um, one thing you want to always take into account when you're using foam core board for something like this that's meant for flat paper is the size difference because the foam core board is thicker, it actually increases the size a little bit that's going to be required um, of the templates. You can work that in without needing to print your templates larger. You just may not be able to match them up line for line. You may need to give them a little extra space. Um, as you can see, um, I've used the templates to create the dome portion of the scaffolding as well. And uh, I did factor in my the oversizing that the foam core um, does when I made these patterns so that they they matched up fairly well and um, I'm just comparing here the sizing of the patterns to the sizing of the scaffolding and uh, what I did to do this this the dome part is I cut the patterns into four pieces instead of doing it in halves that way I was able to create all you know the entire area around the top of the helmet and around the bottom of the helmet Otherwise, you only have two halves, and uh, that makes it a little bit difficult. You have to cut them into four pieces instead of just two in order to get that full 360 coverage. Um, the scaffolding also gives you a good idea of the shape of the helmet. As you can see, the helmet does kind of have a downward slope from front to from back to front, and um, the scaffolding uh, clearly shows that. Um, that slope, that very sharp angle, as you can see here. And uh, when you create the helmet, you're actually kind of creating it, and the helmet sort of looks up a little bit. But when you wear it, you're looking straight ahead, and the mouth part is, is angled further down in the back. So we're taking the dome away at this point, so we can go ahead and, uh, and work on getting the cheeks put together, and then we're going to wrap the helm and uh, the helmet, and we don't need the dome on there when we wrap the templates around the, the helmet scaff scaffolding. So the first thing we've got to do before we do our um, scaffolding is we've got to glue the cheek pieces together. These cheek pieces are two. They come as two pieces on the Wizard of Flight pattern. There's the outside and the inside. Uh, there's a defined line on the uh, on the inside piece that you can follow when gluing the outside piece to it. But what it, what this does is it creates a lip that you can use to tape this cheek piece into the uh, the mandible or as the, the template labels it, the cheekbone, the upper cheekbone piece. So we're just 
taping it together here with some just simple white glue. Um, don't go too crazy on the glue. You will make this. Uh, you will make this the cheeks here a little bit lumpy, which will create more work for you to have to sand through down the road. And we're just making sure we get them together nice and smooth. And then we wipe off any excess glue. And also make sure that you get um, you get them nice and straight, edge to edge. If you don't, then your edges will be off, and that just means you're going to have to do some extra trimming um, after you've you've got it all glued together. And make sure you do both cheeks, and just let them dry. You know, the white glue it doesn't take a whole lot of time to dry, but just give it adequate time. One of the things to remember about when doing a scratch-built helmet is that it's all about patience, all about having patience and, and using that patience because um, this will probably be the hardest thing that you do in regard to uh, regarding building your Mandalorian armor. If you do a scratch-built helmet, uh, it's definitely the hardest thing you'll, you'll put together. And here we're just putting together the second... Um, the second cheek and again make sure you get those edges together and wipe off any excess glue and don't go overboard with the glue don't make them lumpy and give them plenty of time to dry it's not a race Now once these dry, we'll go ahead and we'll tape them um, into the upper, the mandible portion or the, the upper cheekbone portion of the pattern. We're going to have to make a slight crease <coughs> in order to do that, but uh, you'll see uh, when we get to that portion um, how, how that's done. And, And of course, these are our patterns that we've we've already put them together. We've cut them out. We've taped them together. Um, the patterns are on the edges of the patterns are labeled with letters. So you just put those letters. Uh, you just match those letters to each other, and just like this. And then you tape them at that. You match the little half moon shape up there together, letter to letter, and then you tape them and you have a full pattern at that point. The top corner of each pattern has this half moon shape or a quarter moon shape. When you put it together you get a half moon or a half circle shape. So you know you've got the correct patterns in the correct places when you make that half circle and then that is where you would tape. And you just tape directly down the line there, right down the center, tape in the front, and tape in the back of the pattern. And then what we do after that is we just wrap it around. We'll wrap it around the helmet, and then we'll cut out the center where the cheekbone is. We'll cut that part out, and as you can see here, we've got the cheekbone is now ready to be glued. We've made a crease there, or a, sm a slight crease in the top corner of the cheek of the upper cheekbone that comes down to the lower cheekbone. And what that does, that gives us the ability to bend the cheekbone pattern so that it will fit appropriately into the rest of the helmet pattern. And it also gives you the appropriate shape of your cheek area. And then we just line it up edge to edge. And um, once we get everything lined up and we get the proper the proper angle in there, it's just a case of taping it together at that point. We'll tape it all up, and then we will tape it to the rest of the helmet. So we're going to tape it from the back, and then. We'll, uh, we'll turn it around and we'll do some taping on the front.
and you may have a little bit of uh, you may have a little bit of tape over there at the bottom that you can trim off. But the good thing about using the tape on the uh, on the back or on the inside is that that doesn't that won't inhibit the paper from uh, absorbing the resin because you do want the cardstock to absorb as much resin as absolutely possible. That way it stays. That way it, it holds shape. It stays. Uh, it, it keeps maximum strength throughout the curing process. And also, when you use the uh, plenty of tape on this, is that you kind of guarantee that it holds the appropriate shape. That's very important. That the um, that the templates and the the overall pattern itself um, holds the appropriate shape. And now we're just going to attach that inner cheekbone to the outer cheekbone, or mandible, whatever you like to call it. And it's mostly just letting the tape do the work for you. Once you've got it taped, um, the tape will do the bulk of the work at this point. It's just pressing one piece of paper to another. It's pretty simple. And you may have to tidy up your alignment just a little bit. But there is your cheekbone, and it fits right in that little um, cutout place in the front of the helmet. That little cutout area there is where the cheekbones are supposed to fit. It's basically the uh, the area cut specifically for the cheekbones to to fit into. And we're going to do the same thing on the other side. And what we're doing here is we're creasing. We're going to crease our cheekbone here on the other side. And I'm just showing you how to do this with, I'm using my little metal ruler, but you can use a wooden ruler, whatever you've got on hand. You just need something that's got a real straight, sharp edge. And what I do is I just kind of measure in to where I see the, the apex of the curve of the lower cheekbone and where it touches the upper cheekbone, and that's where I make my um, crease. And you may need to, you know, you may need to 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 move your crease around a little bit. You can um, even after you make it, you can always move that crease around just a, a touch to uh, better line it up appropriately. But just like we did on the other side, we're just taping down the cheeks here. The lower cheeks to the upper cheeks and we're taping them from the back and not so much the front.
At this point, we're going to be attaching the cheek to the rest of our cutout templates. Basically, what's going to be the skin of the helmet that we're going to be fiberglassing over the top of. And you, one thing you really want to make sure you do is you want to be meticulous about getting these, uh, these edges of each piece of the template together um, flush with each other. You want these to fit edge to edge. You don't want any gaps because gaps uh, create spaces that you're going to have to um, worry about filling. It's just going to create an extra worry that you really don't need when dealing with um, putting a helmet together like this. And you're going to see, you're going to see here that uh, I'm very meticulous, and I take a lot of time and several different uh, uh, tries at getting this, um, getting these edges flush together. And uh, it can be, it can feel a little monotonous, but uh, you really want to get those edges together. It's imperative that you do. Um, one thing that I make sure that I do when I'm doing a project like this, that's uh, that's involving paper templates used as a skin um, is I don't um, I don't push the paper down onto the tape with a lot of pressure to start out with until I know that I've got the position that I want it to be in and then I will do um, I'll, I'll push the tape against the paper enough to finally seal it otherwise um, if you have to go back and pull up you know a paper template off tape you risk the chance of tearing the template, and you really don't want to do that. Um, you're going to have enough to worry about just getting the thing together. So be patient with it and uh, put it together slowly. Make sure you get those edges um, next to each other because if you don't, again, you're going to create spaces that you have to fill, and uh, that's, just, that's just more work than you really need. And you're also going to, your, your uh, template, as you add the cheek to it here, your template is going to ripple in a little bit. It's going to want to fold in naturally. You're going to need to push that fold out from the inside so that uh, you acquire the proper shape. And again, as you can see, I'm, uh, I'm making sure everything is lined up correctly. I can't stress enough how important patience is when doing this. Now, one reason why this template or this, uh, I'm sorry, this tutorial came to be is uh, my friends at uh, Cosplay Iceland um, came to me and said, "Hey, we're working on getting some uh, some uh, recruits into the Mandalorian Mercs. We don't really have a very good helmet option here. Do you mind doing a helmet tutorial so that we can make our own helmets?" And I said, sure, why not? You know, um, I'm always uh, always out there trying to get new recruits for, for the Mando Mercs, and that's kind of one of my primary jobs. So uh, so that's one reason, that's a big reason why this tutorial came to be. Um, that and the fact that it's probably been the most requested tutorial over the last two years. Um, if you want to visit my friends at Cosplay Iceland, you can do so by going to www.cosplay.is. I'm sure they'd love to uh, love for you to drop by and see some of the cool things that they do. And uh, right here, we're uh, we're working on putting the the template, which is now a skin. We're working on putting that skin onto the helmet. And again, this can this isn't quite as difficult um, a part as as getting the the cheeks on. Mainly, what it boils down to is just taping the skin and making sure that you've got the correct um, you know that that your skin is the correct size that it needs to be and you're gonna find this out when you put it on your uh, scaffolding here and if you've done like I did and you've used a, a more rigid material like um, this uh, foam project board it is quite a bit thicker you know it is um, it is three millimeters uh, I'm sorry. It's uh, yeah. It's three millimeters, about four millimeters thick. So it you know you have to take into account those those extra um, millimeters when you're doing this kind of uh, this kind of thing. Because if you don't, then your template um, is not going to fit around the scaffolding properly.
the good thing is the templates do allow for some um, for some wiggle room in um, in the measurements on them so you can actually cut the pieces a little bit bigger than you need to um, once you've got them printed out you can actually add some space on now you're gonna see here that the template doesn't quite reach all the way around to the front it's about it's probably about a quarter of an inch or so too short so what I did was on the back as you're gonna see here on the back of the template I actually took and um, I took the tape off and the line where you should tape it right down the center I actually moved it out a bit about another half an inch and taped it there I left enough material to do that and it allowed me to make it flush on the front without having to cut everything apart and and do the whole thing over again so leave yourself a little bit of extra room on that uh, on the two back halves of the template and uh, that way if you need to do some sizing you can cut it and do that so now the template the skin is on the scaffolding you can see how it lines up real well it's nice and flat in the front you've got the the proper shape all the angles are there nicely you've got the flat ears and what we're going to do is we're going to come back and we're going to cut out some cardboard pieces to fit over the raised areas what I've done here is I went ahead and I've put together the dome I've cut out the templates and I've taped it all together and there are a few little um, things that you need to be aware of when making the Wizard of Flight uh, dome template when you put it together now there's a little shaded area at the bottom of the template that basically holds it together and you're going to remove that uh, before you tape it before you uh, put the helmet on but another thing you're going to want to do too because the dome actually is a bit higher than it should be so you're going to measure up about five millimeters into the template right underneath the numbers here and you're going to cut that off around as well and uh, the way this template works is it actually um, it actually fits together number to number so you're going to see that uh, one fits next to one and you've got uh, 10 next to 10 and you've got um, there's another set I believe it's eight next to eight anyway um, you'll see that they're numbered each section is numbered but um, one thing that happened when I was putting together my dome that I I didn't realize I just wasn't thinking about it is that because my um, helmet is slightly larger because the scaffolding is made out of a thicker material um, I didn't realize that that would also affect my dome but it did it affected the uh, the size of my dome um, in width and length not in height because we wanted it lower but uh, what it did after I set it on the helmet I noticed that it wasn't quite wide enough and it wasn't quite long enough so um, I took my ruler and I just measured the width that uh, that I was missing and uh, we're going to show you that here uh, real quick as you can see it's it's definitely a little bit smaller than it should be on the diameter side so uh, we've got to measure um, how much of a diameter we're off and I believe it was around um, I think it was somewhere around like three or four millimeters maybe five millimeters um, on diameter so what we have to do is we have to make a shim well a shim will basically give us that extra uh, width that extra diameter that we need for it to properly uh, sit on the helmet so we take a uh, first we take a measurement of how much that that we need um, to recover with that shim and um, you're going to see me do that measurement here shortly um, but once we get the measurement then we can uh, make the the shim appropriately to recover the uh, the dimer that we've lost because our lower part of the helmet is bigger so yeah as you can see there I'm, I'm uh, 
I've got my center line between one and one on the helm on the dome template lined up with the center line of the bottom template, and I'm just measuring it to get the proper measurement. And I measure it on each side, and that gives me a a a, a very good um, number for uh, a very good you know number of of millimeters that I need to add to that dome. Um, in order to recover the the space that I've lost, and we're going to split it down the middle to put the shim in the dome in the uh, the dome template itself. So, what I'm doing here is I'm just taking a, a small uh, off cut piece of uh, cardstock, and I'm just going to measure out. I'm measuring about half an inch because I like to have a little extra material to play with, just in case. It's better to have too much and trim down. Than not enough and have to you know uh, add more or create a whole new piece or something of that nature. So I'm just marking it here to uh, to create uh, a line that half inch line to cut for my shim pieces. And then once we get the line made, we'll cut the template right up the middle on one side and we'll add the shim and then we'll cut it up the middle on the other side and add the shim at the back. We don't want to cut the template completely in half. We want to just do one side at a time. And make sure you uh make sure you're working on an appropriate uh, an appropriate length as well so that you when you create your shim that it stretches the entire length um, of the of the half of the, the helmet dome. If you don't, then uh, you're not going to have enough material there for your shim, and you're going to end up having to redo the whole thing all over again. So I just used the whole piece, and um, I probably could have cut, you know, used the the off cut of that first piece to to cut my second shim out of, but uh, I went ahead and used another piece of uh, of paper. So here we've got our dome shim installed on the uh, in the dome, the shim that we just made. And as you can see, it's uh, it's been taped in fairly well, and uh, it goes right in the center of the front, and it goes in the center of the back as well. And what I did was I had to taper it. Um, I had to taper it so that the shim would, um, so the helmet dome itself would keep the proper place. So as you can see. The shim starts out at a peak in the middle, and it becomes wider and wider and wider as it comes down to the center. It stops at about half an inch wide, down at the well, slightly less than half an inch wide, down at the center line at the bottom and uh, at the the back and at the front. So what I've done here is I've cut out uh, templates again. I've printed them out and I've uh, I've glued them to cardboard and cut them out, so that this will be our raised uh, areas on the helmet. And predominantly, it's the T-visor, it's the ear, uh, the flat area for the ears, and it's the band that runs around um, the back of the helmet as well. And so what we're going to do is we're just, we're just using our hands here to bend them, to add curvature so that the, um, the cardboard templates will match up to, um, to our helmet um, skin there that we've that we've already taped on and put together and taped on. And this part is fairly easy. It's just basically bending the cardboard to fit around these areas of the helmet. And you want the ear part, the ear area where the ear caps go, to remain relatively flat because that part of the helmet is flat. But um, the rest of them are going to be bent. Um, they're going to have quite a bit of curve added to them. And I just used white glue to uh, glue the um, the the uh, poster board, um, the cardstock. I'm sorry, templates to the uh, the cardboard. Now, the great thing about the cardboard is that as we start as we start adding our um, our resin, when we start adding our epoxy resin in the beginning, before we even start fiberglassing, the cardboard is going to soak up that epoxy resin, and it's going to give us a very rigid um, support frame around the helmet. 
that makes it quite a bit easier to uh, fiberglass, to lay up the fiberglass on when we get to that, that portion. But uh, that's just something to think about. Uh, you don't have to do it that way. I did it that way and it seemed to work really well. Those, that rigid, you know, having the front T area completely rigid and having the, uh, the ears and the band that runs around the back of the helmet there rigid before I even got started on doing the fiberglassing really helped to, uh, to add um, to add uh, some stability as I was doing the fiberglassing. So as we're putting the T visor on, you're going to notice the, the, the cardboard in the T area that we did not cut out the actual visor area. We're going to leave that for now, and you'll see why later on in the video why we did that. But, uh, but I'll go ahead and just kind of give you a little heads up there. We did that for support. Um, I did not want to remove that and potentially lose the support of... Uh, you know, of, of having that whole structure there. So what we're looking at here is uh, we're looking at the helmet um, after we've attached all the cardboard and we did take a little bit out after we put the cardboard and glued it on. We took a little bit out of the front there, but not completely, just enough to give us a uh, um, enough recess so that we know where to cut once we've got it all fiberglassed and, and resined up. We want a little bit of recess there, but not a lot. You don't want to take that all the way out because you will lose support. And you need support at this point because if you don't have it, uh, as you're fiberglassing, you could cave in the structure itself. Um, another thing that I've done here is I've also uh, completely coated the helmet with white glue um, like, you know, school type glue. Um, you can use uh, Elmer's glue. Mod Podge is really my favorite to use for stuff like this. But what that does is that uh, that kind of coats it a bit on the outside and gives it a little bit of rigidity. It doesn't keep the resin from bonding to it, but it does sort of, um, it does kind of seal the helmet in a way and it makes it a little bit um, more friendly to the resin that I've found. Uh, when you do surface layup that we're doing here and not so much working from the inside out. Um, and uh, it, it does kind of make it easier to work with and it, it, it actually adds some rigidity to the cheek areas that have no support behind them. Um, and it also fills in some of these little gaps that you have here from just where these cardboard templates don't completely touch. I've put little pieces of cardboard offcuts in there and then trimmed them down to be as flush as I could get them. And then I coated all that with white glue and, uh, and that, really, that really helped. The dome specifically, I believe I've put a, a couple coats of white glue just on the dome itself. And you can see the tape on the dome. There's a few little ripples there in the tape. Don't worry about that. It doesn't have to be perfect. So we've put our first coat of epoxy resin on the helmet. You're going to see here, though, even after one coat of epoxy resin, the dome is still fairly delicate. It can be pushed in easily. Do not put pressure on it. If, it, if you do, you will push it in, and uh, then it's going to be real difficult to get it pulled back out. Um, the resin has also soaked into the cardboard parts just like we wanted it to do. It's made it extremely rigid. Um, even after our first coat, it's still very rigid around the, uh, the, the cardboard areas, and that's helped quite a bit um, to support the helmet as we do this. So what we're going to do now is uh, we're just putting on our second coat of epoxy. Um, this specific epoxy that I use, it's a very thin um, type epoxy. It does take a good while for it to cure fully. Um, I let it sit overnight for each um, uh, for each layup that I did of the epoxy, I just let it sit overnight to cure, and I came back the next day and worked on it. Um, this is going to be probably the longest amount of time that you're going to spend on the helmet is letting the epoxy uh, cure before we even do the fiberglassing. So we're going to put a few coats of epoxy on this before we even do the fiberglassing. I believe we do two coats.
Um, and so with the epoxy, you've got your part A and your part B. You want to make sure that you mix the epoxy appropriately. There will be directions that come with your epoxy resin um, on the ratio in which you need to mix it. Um, it'll be either a one to one, it'll be a two to one, it'll be a three to one, depending on uh, the viscosity of the epoxy itself. And I've used this, this particular type of epoxy in several different applications. So we're going to go ahead and measure out our, um, our parts now, our part A and our part B. And I just use a little measuring scoop. When, I, when I've got several of these laying around, I use these measuring scoops when I, do my, uh, when I put, uh, measure out my epoxy. And for this specific type of epoxy, you have to do a three to one, um, a three to one ratio of uh, part A to part B. So we go ahead and we measure out our um, the, the epoxy itself, which is the clear, and that gets uh, that's a three to one. So you you do three um, equal parts of equal measures of the uh, clear epoxy as we're doing here. And you want to make sure you get it all in there. And here's our last pour. And these are these little um, these little measuring um, these little measuring cups that I'm using here. They are they're numbered, so I can see exactly um, how much epoxy I'm using. And then of course I'm using my my stick here to get out all of the actual epoxy resin. You want these um, you want these measurements to be as precise as possible because if you don't, then your uh, epoxy will not harden up uh, appropriately. Now, I've also put pigment um, in this epoxy. That way, I can tell where the uh, where the the most hardening and soaking in of the of the epoxy has taken place so i'm going to i'm going to show you that too here in this little segment again leave leave no epoxy behind now it's time to measure out our hardener, and we only have to worry about uh, doing uh, one cup of that, one of our little measuring cups of that. Always make sure you put your lids back on your epoxy um, on each of the bottles as you get done with it and move it out of the way. I like to keep it out of the way so I don't spill it. Epoxy is not cheap. Epoxy resin is very expensive. You do not want to waste it. And I'm just using the same cup because these are disposable. And I've got several of them, and I just use them, and I, I toss them. So I'm going to measure the same amount, and I'm only going to do one. I'm only going to do one uh, measurement of the hardener itself. You can always tell the difference between the hardener and the epoxy. At least the kind, the type that I buy, I buy the kind that I can always tell the difference, so that there's no confusion, and so that I get the uh, I'm using the appropriate uh, part. Also, make sure that you do this in a well ventilated area. My shop is fairly well ventilated. I have windows open, I have door open, I have a fan I can put in the windows. I've got a an air conditioning unit that I can just turn on for. Uh, for the air itself, and uh, so I've got a fairly well ventilated workshop to do this in. Now here's the pigment. It's just it's just black pigment. We're just going to add a drop. You can add it. Most people add it to the the resin side. It doesn't really. I've never found it to matter. You can add it to either the resin side. Or the hardener side. I've I've never found to be any difference of which side you add it to, but you mix it in real good. Make sure you mix it in well, so that uh, 
it turns nice and, and uh, it, it turns a, a nice shade of the color that you're going for. In this case, it's black. So if it's you know as long as it turns black, then we know we're 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 doing good. Now I'm just mixing in the resin portion to the hardener, and I'm uh, I'm using my stir stick here to make sure that I get out all of the epoxy. Again, it's very important that you get all of the epoxy or the hardener, whichever you're pouring into the other. Make sure you get all of that material out and into the other part of the material because if you don't, it will not harden correctly. It may not ever harden. It may take days to harden um, and it may never harden correctly at all. And that's, that's never a good thing. So we've got our material in there and now we're just stirring it up. I like to stir it for a good little while to make sure that I get um, the material nice and mixed up, both parts A and part B, so that they are very well mixed. I'll sit and I'll stir them for a good little while, several seconds. I don't really have to worry too much about pot life with this epoxy. Uh, pot life is the time that you have before it begins to harden. This epoxy does take a little while to cure because it is such a thin epoxy. So pot life for me really isn't a big deal when it comes to this epoxy. So now we're pouring epoxy over the dome. I want to make sure I work from the top down as best as possible. And I just pour it on there and I'm using a sponge brush to get the epoxy uh, spread around the dome itself. And all you have to do is lightly brush it. This stuff is extremely thin. We just spread it around the helmet. And of course, it's going to run on its own. The great thing about this type of epoxy, because this is layup epoxy, this is not casting epoxy like you would use to cast a helmet. This is layup epoxy. Um, which is the type of epoxy used to, to lay up fiberglass or carbon fiber, Kevlar, any of that type of material. Um, so this epoxy is actually self-leveling, which means that it will, um, it will level itself. It's not going to, uh, your, your chances of having high spots um, in the epoxy, just the epoxy itself in the resin, are very slim. Um, low spots not really going to happen either. It's going to level itself and um, you don't have to worry too much about dealing with uh, low and high spots. You also don't have to worry too much about uh, air bubbles with this type of epoxy. And as you can see I'm really trying to force it down into what's left of the holes um, in the cardboard from the first layer of epoxy. And you really want to brush the epoxy everywhere. You want to get it on all 100% uh, of the surface of the helmet itself. Be very patient. Um, like I said, make sure that your layup epoxy, you get one with a, a long enough pot life um, so that you can adequately um, get all of the material around the helmet before it sets up and begins to cure on you. And I'm just turning my helmet so that I can get a little bit of a better um, angle on uh, for, for my brush so that I can get the epoxy spread out really well. And because this is a very thin epoxy, it is runny. It is, you are going to drip quite a bit. So make sure that you have something underneath your helmet to catch all that epoxy that drips off. Don't do this in your house. Don't do this on a piece of, of furniture that you enjoy. Um, don't do this on something that may get uh, may lead your wife to divorcing you. Okay, do this in an area where it can get messy, and you know don't do this in your garage and get epoxy on your garage floor, because uh, trying to get up epoxy resin, you know I, I feel sorry for you if you have to try to get up epoxy resin. This stuff is very very tough. It's very strong. That's why I like to use it That's why, you know, on applications like this because it is super strong.
the really good thing about epoxy resin is that for once for one thing it is waterproof um it also is not uh it's not a uh, ultraviolet you know uv light like sunlight isn't a big deal with epoxy resin um and it's just not as messy and it doesn't have nearly as bad of an odor um as uh um, polyester resin does. Polyester resin will run you out of a small space in a heartbeat. So um, just make sure that you know you're getting every every part of the helmet covered. This probably isn't the greatest angle <laughs> on the camera here for showing you guys how I'm, I'm brushing this on, but you can tell that I'm being very meticulous on how much I'm getting on there. One thing you don't want to do is you don't want to be afraid of the epoxy. And make sure that you're wearing the appropriate gloves. Now here we're just, all I'm doing here is I'm putting the last little bit of epoxy on from the cup. And I'm just making sure that it is nice and, and straight and flush. I'm pushing it out of the brush. I don't want my sponge brush soaking up all the epoxy. Now you may ask why are you using a sponge brush? Well, because this is layup epoxy and the pot life is much uh, much longer. I don't have to worry about the brush heating up and melting or anything of that nature. This um, epoxy resin is going to get very hot as it cures. It's going to get extremely hot. It will get hot enough to melt the brush. It'll get hot enough to melt the plastic cups. It will get very hot once it kicks off and begins to cure. And one thing to think about too is, uh, and you'll see it really well in this angle, is the top center of the dome. Um, I let the epoxy pool up there a little bit because that is an area that um, needs as much strength as possible in the top of that dome. And this is the last little bit of epoxy that's in the cup. I'm just just pouring it out on there, and um, you can see the how it how it runs, and you can actually kind of see how the self-leveling works. Here we're getting it all out of the brush. And just spreading it around on the dome. You want to keep the dome happy. And you do that by getting plenty of epoxy on it before you even get into the fiberglassing uh, part. You want to make sure that that dome is nice and um, and fairly rigid before we start laying up the actual fiberglass on it. Any areas that may seem light, that are sort of discolored light, you want to make sure you get epoxy on those areas. The other great thing about uh, um, epoxy resin is that it doesn't eat through gloves. Uh, it will not eat through vinyl gloves like uh, like uh, polyester resin can. And now we will be using polyester resin on this helmet for the um, when we make our filler. But until then, um, until then, we're just using the epoxy resin. Here, I'm just using my fingers to squeeze out what's left of that resin in the brush. I don't want to waste this stuff. Um, like I said, it's not cheap. So I want to make sure I'm using uh, as much of 100% of that resin as possible. Not having to worry about it eating through my gloves, I can actually squeeze it out of the brush and uh, not really worry about that.
Again, it's all about making sure that you adequately coat the helmet. One thing that you'll notice is the uh, where the tape has rippled up a little bit. Um, it's actually caught the epoxy there a little bit, and you can see it at this angle very well. Those little tape ripples there have caught the epoxy, and uh, are kind of creating small little uh, little epoxy kind of reservoirs, I guess you could say. Um, this really doesn't hurt anything. It doesn't, you know, once we put the body filler on there to get it nice and smooth, once we put the fiberglass on, really, you don't even see those anymore. Um, and then, of course, with the body filler, you don't see any of um, any of those little little raised areas there from the tape. So don't stress about that. If you see those, don't worry about it. It's not going to harm your uh, your, you know, the the um, the way in which your epoxy dries on the helmet. It's not going to hurt anything. Once you put the fiberglass on here, you'll never see it anyway. So here I'm just kind of leveling out, smoothing it out. We've been taking some of the epoxy that's dripped off, and I'm putting it on there. I don't. I'm not a big fan of waste. As long as the epoxy that's dripped off doesn't have any contaminants in it, then uh, then you're, you're you know you can still continue to use it until it begins to cure. So and here I'm just checking in the back, making sure that the epoxy is nice and smooth there checking the edges to make sure the epoxy is coated all the edges and it's made it all the way down to the bottom edge of the helmet in all places. All right, so now we're going to do our, um, lay our fiberglass on the dome first. So what we've done is we have cut our fiberglass pieces to go on the dome the same shape of the actual dome uh, templates themselves. Very tedious job, but we've we've already done that. Um, I just printed out another set of the dome templates, and I used a Sharpie to trace the templates on top of the fiberglass, and then I used scissors to uh, cut those uh, pieces of fiberglass out so that when we put them on the dome, they'll create the same exact um, they'll create the same surface as the dome itself. We didn't have to worry about our shim on like we did in the paper, putting the paper template together because the fiberglass itself will expand as we put it on there. It will spread out and it will fill up those spaces. So, so we've got our um, epoxy resin. We're going to go ahead and put that on. And we're going to get a layer of epoxy on the dome first before we even put the fiberglass on there. You want to uh, uh, go ahead and get a layer of epoxy on there so that it's wet and that way the fiberglass will stick to the dome. It doesn't have to be a thick layer. It just needs to be just enough to um, so that the to put you know to, to give the helmet uh, you know uh, some wetness there so that the fiberglass will adhere to the dome and stay on the dome. Putting the fiberglass on the dome is not an easy thing because you're taking a flat surface and you're making it round. And we're going to start at the front. We're going to start right there from the number one on the well, right in the middle of the number one um, pattern there. And we're just going to press the fiberglass on little bits at a time. We're going to work that fiberglass onto the wetted surface, we're just going to do it, you know, a, a one to two fingers of this template at a time. And, and what we're going to do here is, this is called wetting out. We're, we're impregnating these pieces of fiberglass with the resin itself. 
and we're, we're wetting the fiberglass out. And when you wet it out like this, the fiberglass becomes a lot more easy to work with on these, on these areas. And as you can see, I'm kind of holding down the fiberglass at the top while I wet it down at the bottom so that I can get it to stick down there. The more resin you apply to the fiberglass, um, the more you wet the fiberglass out, the easier the fiberglass becomes uh, to work with. And it will stick much better um, the more uh, wet it out, you make it with the resin itself. And I'm going to forewarn you, this is a very um, detail-oriented process. This is a very uh, time-consuming process, wetting this out. The entire helmet building process is fairly time consuming but this part of it you really want to make sure that you get it as right as possible because it's going to you know the, the better you get the fiberglass on the helmet uh, the least amount of air bubbles you get in the fiberglass the, the easier your life is going to be when it comes to um, sanding down the helmet and uh, applying the, the filler you won't have to do such a hard job sanding down the helmet and you won't have to worry about repairing a bunch of air bubbles if you um, just take your time, apply plenty of resin, and just be patient with it as you work. Make sure to I do a lot of tapping out. As you can see here, I'm really tapping the resin down. I'm making sure my brush has um, resin in it when I tap down on the fiberglass when I as I'm tapping down what that's doing that's just forcing more fiberglass or more resin I'm sorry into the fiberglass mat itself you can pick these pieces up as I'm doing here to straighten them out a bit so that I'm getting them flat against the dome area Of course, the wetter the piece is with resin, the harder it uh, becomes to pick it up. It wants to, um, you, you'll tear it if you're not careful. You don't want to do that. You don't want to tear it. And I'm just using my finger, my gloved finger there, to kind of smooth the, uh, the, the seams where each piece of fiberglass meets the other I'm uh, pushing those I'm, I'm smoothing those down with my finger um, as I'm working the fiberglass and doing that um, keeps you from having these big ridges I mean you're gonna have some ridges where the fiberglass meets the other pieces of fiberglass but if you smooth those pieces down then you, you'll have much uh, much less ridges. They won't be quite as thick. A lot less to sand later on. The type of fiberglass we're using here is just called chop strand mat. Uh, for the helmet, I I went ahead and I used uh, 440 gram or 400 gram. I believe it's 400 gram. It's basically a one point. Um, it's 1.5 ounces, or ounce and a half. It's fairly thick. It's a good uh, two millimeter thick piece of fiberglass. I wanted to make sure that the dome got the thickest fiberglass right from the get-go. This is the only layer of fiberglass it will get, and I wanna make sure it's got the strongest fiberglass um, available.
The chop strand mat, or what they call CSM, is the type of fiberglass it is. It's basically just fiberglass that's pressed down in random, uh, in random patterns. And uh, it's a lot easier to use for these uh, pieces that have a lot of curvature. You don't want to use woven fiberglass on a helmet dome, at least not on the surface, uh, because it is much harder to um, get these nice round areas. So you want to stick with the chop strand mat fiberglass. This stuff is fairly cheap. Uh, you can buy it for, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, the, what I've got is is I've got several rolls left over from building the land speeder. I bought like a 30-yard roll for less than $100, or maybe right at $100 for this thickness. The 0.75 ounce that I'll be using, or the three-quarter ounce that I'll be using um, on some of the other areas below, uh, that was less than $100 for like a 30-yard roll. I think the shipping cost almost as much as the roll did. But this is, chop strand mat is very inexpensive. You can get it at any fiberglass supply. Car auto body supply shops will have it. It is the most commonly used type of fiberglass material in the world. And as you can see, the uh, these pieces fit together fairly well. You can see the seams themselves. They're the darker lines that are running down the, the helmet dome there. But again, you want to be real patient with this process. You want to make sure that you have, um, you know, layup resin that is... Um, that has a long pot life, the longer that you can spend working on getting the proper curvature on this fiberglass on the dome, um, the, the happier you're going to be in the long run. Do not rush it. Take your time. You do not need uh, prior experience to do this, but it does help. Uh, but you don't need prior experience to lay up fiberglass. There are a lot of videos out there, including this one. There are plenty of videos out there where you can uh, uh, watch to um, to kind of learn how to do it. You know, I started out doing this um, by literally building a full uh, life-size Star Wars vehicle, and I had no fiberglassing prior fiberglassing experience to that. And you know, before doing that, so and most people who have seen the land speeder um, are kind of blown away with with how cool it looks. So um, I was very fortunate in that you know I had plenty of time to do it, but I also was very patient. One thing you also want to make sure you do is that you're getting that fiberglass up in the center of the dome. Um, don't worry so much about getting everything flat that you forget to get your, uh, you know, your, the center of your dome fiberglassed up. You can push the fiberglass around um, after it's completely wetted out. You can actually push the fiberglass around without messing up the overall shape, and you can get it, you know, you can collect a little bit of that fiberglass in the dome. So you want to make sure that you do that so that you don't have a soft, I'm sorry, the, in the center of your dome, so you don't have a soft center in your dome. Um, you want to make sure that dome is nice and um, strong, the center especially. The center of the dome needs to be very, very strong. And here I'm just lining it up. Your fiberglass will overlap the other pieces of fiberglass at, I know in, in certain areas, like you can see here, that last, the more rear-facing piece there, 
um, is overlapping the piece before it slightly, that's fine. That doesn't hurt anything. When we go to sand uh, the dome itself, you can sand that uh, you know that rays in the uh, in the fiberglass out of it. Or another thing you can do is as you're wetting this out, you can also push the fiberglass um, out enough or push it down enough so that it will spread out, kind of spread the fiberglass out, and that will help take care of those high areas. One of the things that I had going for me in that respect is that I had those two shims that I had to make, those two shims that I had to make earlier, and those shims were, um, you know, they needed a little bit extra fiberglass to uh, to be even with the rest of the helmet. So that extra fiberglass from the overlapping areas, actually, I forced that into those shim areas, and um, and it ended up flattening out this those you know, evening up that those two parts of the dome so that I didn't have to worry about um, filling it so much later on. So you can do that as well. And you can see that I'm pressing down with the brush to make sure that I'm getting all of the resin out of the brush and onto the fiberglass. Now remember, we've put two coats of, of epoxy resin on the dome, on, on the entire um, helmet, before we even got to the fiberglassing part. So that strengthened our helmet. That got the dome to the point where we could push down on it without worrying too much about making dents in the helmet that we didn't want. <laughs> you know, there's one thing about making a dent that you do want in the helmet, like a Boba Fett dent, and then there's dents that you don't want. And you don't want to have to cut through the resin to pull a dent back out that you accidentally made. Um... So that's another reason why we did put those two coats of epoxy on beforehand. Now here, I have went ahead and I've got the rest of the helmet fiberglassed up, as you can see. I'm just adding the, uh, the last piece on the front, which is right at the T area. And what I'm doing here is I'm, um, I'm trying to force down this... Uh, this area of the epoxy and now we're just going to uh, cut at this point we have covered the rest of our helmet with the fiberglass um, over the cardboard templates, I use the 0.75 ounce fiberglass, and then over the uh, paper template areas that didn't have cardboard, I used the uh, 1.5 uh, grant ounce uh, fiberglass. So the reason why I did that was because the cardboard areas were already fairly thick. I didn't want to make them too thick, so I used a thinner um, fiberglass on them. And then the paper template areas, I wanted them to be strong, just like the dome. So I used the uh, 1.5 ounce on those areas. And that way I only had to worry about putting one layer of fiberglass on each. Um, remember too that the uh, cardboard areas were already very, um, were already very thick and hard from the uh, first two applications of epoxy resin that we put on at the very beginning. So. At this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to trim off um, the areas around the uh, uh, T-visor there where the fiberglass is kind of sticking over. And to do that, I'm just using a pair of very sharp scissors while the fiberglass is still wet before it begins to cure. And it's, it's real easy. And the great thing about the epoxy resin is I just use some acetone before it cures and I can clean these scissors right off so that I can continue to use the scissors. But I'm being very careful about following the line of the template itself. And I'm, I'm actually just going to uh, sort of reuse that fiberglass because it is wet 
All right, so here we have the helmet. Um, we have completely fiberglassed it and we have sanded it down using uh, 80 grit sandpaper. Um, we wanted to make the surface nice and rough and uh, so that the body filler would stick to it appropriately. Um, epoxy resin uh, doesn't like to mix well with polyester resin unless it is roughed up. The surface has to be rough because epoxy dries almost like glass. Um, so we've roughed it up We've cleaned it off, and now we're ready to do our filler. So what we're doing here now is we're, um, we're going to make our body filler using what's called Q-cells. Q-cell is uh, just a really fine powder. It's finer than sand. It's about as fine as talcum powder. Uh, but these are basically little micro balloons, and they're extremely light. I mean, it's a very, very light substance. An ounce of this stuff, this bucket doesn't even weigh a pound. That's how light this stuff is. And what you do is you mix it with your resin um, to create a body filler of, uh, or just a filler um, of your, uh, you know, d depending on how thick you want it. Uh, for this, we're not going to, to make it super thick. It's going to be about the consistency of, I would say, maybe a heavy gravy. <laughs> just for lack of a better term. Uh, it's gonna be you know, somewhat thick, but not super thick. So what we're doing here is uh, we're measuring out um, our polyester resin. Uh, you can buy this stuff at Walmart or any um, body, uh, car auto body supply store, anything of that nature. Um, so we're measuring that out. There's about an ounce, there's an ounce of, um, of resin in the cup. And for that specific resin, it takes about 10 drops of hardener to equal uh, one ounce of resin. So make sure that you read your directions uh, that come with the resin so that you know how much hardener to put in there. Now, I'm not sure why I'm pouring this resin in another cup. I think I was just uh, still stuck on my epoxy resin, <laughs> and uh, that's why I put it in another cup. But... Um, but again, you know, just like with the epoxy resin, you want to make sure that you thoroughly mix it. You don't want to waste it. But fiber or, uh, polyester resin is significantly cheaper than epoxy resin. Most people will use a polyester resin because it is, like I said, it is much cheaper than epoxy resin. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to come by. You can buy this stuff at, you know, any, any auto supply or Walmart or hardware store, whatever. Um, and again, always read your directions on the can. It will tell you uh, how much to mix uh, hardener versus the resin itself. We're gonna go ahead and put our uh, 10 drops of hardener in. Now, uh, if you live in a much colder climate, you can always put maybe an extra drop of hardener in there. Uh, if you live in a warmer climate, take away a drop. Maybe take away two drops if you live in like Florida or, you know, uh, somewhere of a tropical climate. Now here we're adding the Q cells. Um, there's no real decent measurement for that. I just measure it based on how um, how well uh, it the consistency is uh, based on you know how, what I want. Um, and again, we're looking for something that's uh, the consistency of like a real thick you know, kind of a thick gravy or real thick, thick syrup. I'm not looking for um, a super hard, dense consistency uh, because we want this to be very spreadable and we want it to get in all of the cre crevices and little nooks and crannies that are all over the helmet, as you can see. We wanna, we've want we got to be able to flatten the helmet out, um, To I'm sorry, to smooth it out. And the only way to do that is with a, um, you know, with a resin product that uh, that can get into all those little cracks and low spaces and uh, and everything. So uh, here we're getting ready to spread it. Now there are, the pot life on this is not that long. Um, you know, depending on how much hardener you put in there, you're going to get 15 to maybe maybe at the most 20 minutes. But um, we're going to go ahead and spread this on. Now, I use an old piece of acrylic that I've cut a hole in to kind of make an artist palette out of it. And, uh, and then I use a rubber, um, a rubber uh, um, resin spreading spatula. Basically, it's a filler spreading spatula. Um, 
Again, you can get those, the spatulas, you can get those at any auto body supply store or uh, Walmart or hardware store, anything that, any place that sells resin is going to sell the spatulas as well. And the great thing about the rubber spatulas is when this stuff dries, when it does cure and dry on there, you can just bend the spatula to break it off. So, so we've got it on our acrylic. I'm going to move the helmet here so that we can get to it. And I'm just scraping scraping filler and just kind of just gently running it across the helmet. It's pretty simple. I'm sure many of you have already used filler products before when working on, you know, costumes or whatever your, you know, whatever automotive needs you may have had for it. And we're just making sure that we get it in all those low spots. I'm not really worried about, um, you know, those spread lines in the filler. I'm just worried about getting the filler on the helmet and getting those low spots filled. And we're going to do, you know, we... we do about three layers of filler on the helmet. Um, and the reason why we do three layers is because you're gonna sand these layers down so they're gonna be extremely thin, especially that first layer once you sanded it all down. So you're gonna use a few layers on here. And I don't think I mentioned it earlier, but those Q-cells, um, you can actually substitute talc powder, talcum powder just like body powder for the Q cells, it's a much, it's a you know kind of a cheap uh, substitution. The Q cells themselves are not expensive; they're not very expensive at all. Um, the place I get mine, I can get like a gallon tub like that one for, I think like ten or fifteen bucks. And that stuff, you know, that stuff it lasts a long time. I've had that since I built the land speeder back in 2015. It doesn't really go bad, and it doesn't take a whole lot to get to the thickness that you want it to be in. We're basically glazing, you know, making a glaze to glaze this helmet with. And again, you want to make sure that uh, you spread this stuff out nice and even. You want to keep your, uh, your lines fairly crisp. Uh, those raised areas like the band around the helmet, um, you want to make sure that you run around those with the corner of the spatula so that it's nice and crisp. And it's the uh, body filler has not yet started to kick yet, but it's it's getting there. It's starting to, to gel up just a little bit, so we know that it's gonna be kicking here soon. So we've got it spread out fairly well. This is about the way your first layer is going to look. And then you're, once this dries, you're going to sand it, and then you're going to add another layer, and then you're going to sand that layer, and you're going to check for low spots, spots that you really need to concentrate on for your third layer. Now, you may decide that you need to do a fourth layer, depending on how many low spots still exist in, uh, in the, the helmet after you've put that third layer on. So that's something that you just need to address. You know, it's going to be case by case, depending on how well you did the first, you know, uh, uh, the first two layers. And you're going to put this over the entire helmet. And this is our finished helmet. It's, it's nice and smooth. It's, it's ready to do, you know, uh, everything else that needs to be done to it at this point. Um, we've been able to um, get all of our low spots taken care of. Now, if you wanted to add a box in the back, you know, the key slot box, you can do that. You can cut that out. You can um, epoxy that in. Um, you know, you can add your ears at this point. It's really, you know, ready to do with whatever you want to do. Um, it's got a nice shape. Here I'm putting an ear cap against it to show you how that looks, how that would look with an ear cap on it. But it's got a it's got a really beautiful shape to it. Um, it's it's got the correct flare.
It's nice and flat on the sides, so you can put your ear cap on it. The main thing, as always, is being patient. Be patient with it. Um, don't get frustrated. This, you know, this is, there's a reason why this is a master class tutorial. And it's not because you can't do it if, you're, if you don't have experience with it. It's because it is a difficult job to do. It is a very difficult task to do, which is why I made it a master class. Um, you should, uh, you know, you should always look at a, a project like this as something that is just going to teach you uh, some awesome lessons. You're going to learn a, a really great skill, um, and that's that's really the key: is learning the skills and the techniques that you can pass on to to you know more people uh, around you that are also interested in it. Because you know you're not going to find a lot of helmet makers uh, spread out everywhere. So, um, so yeah, this is I mean this is basically our helmet at this point, and you know it's a blank slate to do whatever you want to do with. And uh, it's, you know, it's nice and smooth. Like I said, you can see that it's got the, the perfect shape for a Mandalorian helmet. And really, at this point, it's, you know, you could even prime it and paint it and, you know, do whatever that, at this point. Um, I would suggest definitely putting some ear caps on it. You don't have to worry about the box in the back, but you could use this as a base for sculpting a whole new uh, sculpt of helmet um, and casting and selling those, you know. So the sky's really the limit uh, at this point. But uh but here again we have our finished helmet and if you followed this tutorial and you've built your own helmet then you should be proud of yourself for doing it. Um you've accomplished something that most other uh Mandalorian Mercs members have never done. And uh and I appreciate you joining me at the shop. And um, look forward to uh, meeting, seeing you again on the next uh, War Masters Workshop Masterclass. And uh, you take care.